In November 2013, the then pro-Russian cabinet suspends Ukraine's Euro integration process. On November 21st, during the Eastern Partnership Summit, President Yanukovych declines to sign the association agreement with the European Union. Before dawn on November 30th, the Berkut, a special forces unit of the Interior Ministry, beat striking students on Kyiv's independent square. The next day, almost a million people took to the streets. The Maidan was born. During December, protests spread throughout Ukraine, including regions traditionally loyal to Yanukovych and his party. What became commonly known as the Dictatorship Laws, which were illegally adopted by the pro-Russian coalition in Parliament on January 16th, actually were intended to lay the legal framework for the Kremlin to politically occupy Ukraine. The Soviet Union was about to be remade. In response, the protest turned into a national uprising. In the ensuing clashes, three protesters were killed by the Berkut. As tensions grew, neither side would back down, resulting in a month-long standoff. On February 18th, protesters marched on Parliament to support an initiative by lawmakers to limit the power of the president. This march was that excuse the government needed to use deadly force to end the protest. Following several days of clashes, over 100 protesters were killed. They became known as Heaven's Company. Fearing the nation's wrath, the president fled to Crimea and from there to Russia. The 1997 Treaty of Friendship allowed the Russian armed forces five bases on the Crimean Peninsula. From these enclaves, the invasion of Crimea was launched by the Russian Occupation Army. From February 23rd to the 28th, pro-Ukrainian and pro-Russian demonstrations were held at the Crimean Parliament. Hundreds of people from Russia were bussed in to support the pro-Russian element. On the night of February 27th, the Russian armed forces stormed the Crimean parliament, which under pressure from the Russian army, announced a referendum on May 25th to join the Russian Federation. Over the next two weeks, the Russian armed forces gained de facto control over the peninsula. the Ukrainian army was outnumbered and surrounded. By March 26th, all Ukrainian military bases were captured by the Russian army. President Putin signed a decree annexing Crimea into the Russian Federation. But this was only part one of the Kremlin's agenda. Novorossiya, a quasi-state, was supposed to be created out of Ukraine's eastern and southern regions. This was the Kremlin's plan to resolve the Ukrainian question. To realize this goal, Russian agents simultaneously seized regional administration buildings in Kharkiv and Donetsk on April 6th and Luhansk on April 29th. In the spring of 2014, the events began with the Crimea, and then they occurred in Slovyansk. We started to watch these events more closely, 
Our friends and acquaintances, the community of Lugansk, became divided. They started to define themselves by the principle of us versus them. Some of them supported the separation and creation of the republics. Some of us supported Ukraine. We saw what was going on and how people changed, or followed the example of friends and their inner circle of people. I mean, when people you have known for years, who were your friends, many of whom I knew as a child, start to change, you realize that either the world has gone mad, or you have. It's indeed a very scary thing when you see how people's consciousness changes. It's very scary. They first recognized me at the pro-Ukrainian demonstration in front of Shevchenko's monument. It was held on March 9th, which is also Shevchenko's birthday. Before that, similar demonstrations were quite peaceful. Pro-Russian demonstrations were held simultaneously. But on the 9th, the other side went on the offensive. The pro-Russian demonstrators started beating us, including me, and we ran away. This was the last pro-Ukrainian demonstration in our city. One of my friends called and said, join us. I said, Zhenya, if you had gone with the Ukrainian flag and shouted, uh, what's his name? Poroshenko is a bastard. I would have joined you, but excuse me. You went shouting with the Russian tricolor, and that's something different. This was the same guy who later got me out of jail. This is how it went. They would gather all of us in common rooms. The representatives of the so-called Luhansk People's Republic would come and explain how we should work in the newly established republics. I mean, how to conduct bookkeeping, prepare for the referendum, communicate with the locals. This actually became the reason why I made an appearance for one more time. Because eventually, I wasn't selected for the commission. The pro-Russian members of the polling commission didn't even call me because of my attitude, which I wasn't hiding. But I attended the referendum itself to say in front of the head of the polling commission that what matters is the signature of a person who received a ballot. As they were counting ballots, they threw the no votes away and replaced them with the yes votes. You wouldn't be able to prove that you had voted if there was neither your name nor number on that ballot. You see, the election process itself was corrupt. They kicked me out of there promptly counted the votes, and came up with more than 80% yes votes. And the republic was proclaimed. On April 14th, the Kharkiv Regional Administration Building was released from Russian control by a special ops unit of the Ukrainian Interior Ministry called Jaguar. This was the start of the anti-terrorist operation. From April to May, the ATO turned into a war with tanks, artillery, and aviation. After the first helicopter flew over, we lived near the airport in Severodonetsk. We thought that things would return to normal in a couple of days. But that didn't happen. Time went on, and things were just getting more complicated, 
We heard how every day our checkpoints were shelled and how it was relatively close to our city. We needed to do something. We had this inner need to do something, to help somehow. You just could not do nothing. In June 2014, we collected what our friends offered for help. We went out and contacted the IDAR Volunteer Battalion and offered our help bringing them goods, driving from occupied Severodonetsk along forest paths and trails. I didn't know the road to Lugansk at all. Actually, I went where I was brought, as the saying goes. At the last Ukrainian checkpoint, they didn't warn us that the next one was an enemy's checkpoint. I fell asleep in the car for half an hour, and half asleep, they stopped us at the checkpoint. I said, glory to Ukraine. The Russians said, what? I repeated, glory to Ukraine. Well, only then did I notice that they were wearing Novorossiya patches. Actually, a friend of mine told me that they're already coming after you. I moved in with my mother in Stanitsia Luhansk, a small town. But this didn't stop them from finding me there. The stronghold of the Ruski Mir, the Russian world in Stanitsia, isn't any smaller than a Luhansk city. And so on the 1st of August, at around 10 a.m., they broke into my house. I received a call. It was the principal. He warned me, someone is coming for you, get out. I thought, wow, who are they? I suspected it must be a bastard. But there was no point in escaping, because it was impossible. I went through a passage and they stopped me. Are you Dmitrotinda? They asked. I said, I am. Why? Get your stuff and let's go. And away they took me. This frenzy lasted for about two hours. I was handcuffed, forced to kneel. The pro-Russian fighters tapped me on the forehead asking, how do you access internet? And similar questions. There had not been electricity for a while because they destroyed all the power lines and the district was out of electricity. But seeing my activity, they wanted to know what I was doing. I argued that they were wrong and must have confused me with someone else. Of course, it didn't work. They carried me to the basement of the Luhansk Oblast State Administration. And then the captors threw me in a bus. It had no windows and no doors. I mean, with doors but no windows. They held a gun up to me. They said, one move and we'll shoot you. You can run, but the bullet will catch you. This is the Kharkiv Regional Administration building today, a city center like any other, working to improve the lives of Kharkiv residents. It wasn't supposed to be like this. In Luhansk and Donetsk, Russian agents and their proxies took hostages. 
many of them remain incarcerated. A few of them managed to escape. There were sacks of sand with some blanks from used shells. It was for propaganda purposes, like that's what the Ukrops, the Ukrainian army, beat us with. At that time, the anti-terrorism operation was already quite active. There was shelling and so-called airstrikes, according to their version. I mean, there was already something to show. There was a memorial board where there were photos of separatists who had already died. There was a hedgehog-like barbed wire around it, and it was impossible to drive up there. Although, who would drive up there at that moment? It was uh, like a, a basement room. There were stairs on both sides. Uh, first, uh, there's a big lobby, then a corridor, and there were rooms along the corridor. Actually, the majority of detainees were held in the basement of the regional administration building. Most of them were citizens of Luhansk. That ended up here for absolutely trumped up reasons. For example, if they didn't like your face or accused you of looting, one person was passing by a shop with a broken showcase and they approached him and said, you're a looter, and grabbed him. There were real looters and local pro-Russian fighters. There were cases when someone tried to guard a destroyed shop and was simply eliminated by writing false accusations. Later, those who wrote those false accusations would easily take away what remained in the store or in someone's house. This was a zone of complete absurdity. There were women who had stolen something in order to feed their babies. In particular, I was sitting with one woman who stole baby formula. And after various sexual favors for the pro-Russian fighters, she managed to free herself after 24 hours to get to her one-year-old child. While placed under a lot of pressure, beatings and shootings, the captors tried to choke my wife, suffocate her with a bag, in order to loosen her tongue, to intimidate her into telling everything she knew. They would do mock shootings. Come over, take out a gun from its holster, reload it, put it to your forehead and shoot. It happened to me. But the gun wasn't loaded, it just clicked. I didn't know if it was loaded. Then the shooter loaded the gun for real and shot again. This time when he shot, he took the gun off my forehead and shot this way and that way. After one of the shots, I was wounded. The hostage takers began to ask weird questions like what I knew about the Third Force, what is my code name. Of course, I pretended that I did not understand what they were talking about. And the third question is, again, about communication channels. 
Every time I gave an answer that didn't satisfy them, I was hit with a rifle from the same red-haired guy who had brought me here. Finally, Kornievsky, the guy in charge of illegal detentions, got nervous and ordered him to take me to the journalist. At that moment, I still did not quite understand what was happening. They took me out and led me to the back room in the corridor. I thought they would put me with the journalist and that the execution would end. I understood why they brought me here when I was taken to an open room with an open door where walls were splattered with fresh and old bloodstains on the wall at chest level. It was obvious why they led me there. On the way there, one person joined us, then one more, and later in the process of beating me, and as I re far as I recall, I felt like there were two more people. They threw me to the ground. There was absolutely nothing in this room, only heating pipes in the corner. I stood with my head up to it for as long as this was happening, until I lost consciousness. When I came to, it was dark and it was damp. It was hard to breathe. As it turned out, I was in a refrigerator. Well, the so-called refrigerator cell, where they threw those who were beaten badly enough. That's where I spent the first three days, as far as I remember. Uncertainty is what always frightens you the most. When in solitary confinement, there's complete uncertainty. You do not understand what's happening to you, or what might happen next, or what they might do to you. Then they said right to our faces, you are not listed anywhere, you are the disappeared. Parts of my brain were damaged. It was the parts of the brain responsible for speech, coordination, and many other functions. For instance, I could say something physically, but I could not express what I wanted to say. At the end of three days, they brought in their medical assistant who was treating the pro-Russian proxies. He cut the plastic handcuffs, which had already gone deep into my skin, with a scalpel and transferred me to a cell they call the third. It looked like it was an archive room because there were shelves and there were card catalogs with passports which were invalid and other documents a bunch of files and folders and papers. At that time, some girls had already somehow settled down on the floor. There were mattresses and even bed linen laying on the floor. And so, side by side, in a row, 12 people could fit closely. If it turned out to be more than this, it was problematic. It was nuts. Imagine this closed room with closed doors, and it's literally like a matchbox. There's a hole in the wall leading outside through which everyone used to blow smoke. Well, that's not normal. There was always a district police officer from the town of Elchevsk lying in front of me, under my feet. And he just died. Well, he was breathless, literally. He said, that's it. 
I'm dying. I sat by him for hours and waved the notebook to create some kind of air. We were in a basement all the time. The third cell, as the hostage takers called it, wasn't marked in any way. They hung hinge locks on the door. It was a former dining room and a maintenance room of the Oblast Regional State Administration, where food was prepared, like a storeroom. Actually, in this third cell too, there was a fairly large refrigerator where carcasses of meat were kept. Well, it was visible because the hooks were hanging there and so on. All these refrigerators didn't function and there was a terrible smell. As I said, there was no electricity. There was also a sink where they washed something once in a while. These racks and all were connected in some way with the maintenance of the state administration building. They would line us up at 2 a.m. as I remember. It was difficult emotionally. You had just started to doze off, which was welcoming because it was around 40 degrees. You just lay there sweating, barely breathing. Then as soon as you've fallen asleep, at 1 or 2 a.m. they would come to line us up for roll call in the corridor. You don't have a name, you only have a nickname. Looter or something similar. I don't remember what they wanted. They could pick three people out of 20, 30 or 40. The numbers varied and tell them that they would be executed. I was among the three. Maybe they were trying to pressure us morally. It's over. You're going to be shot. The first days, when I was interrogated, there was just one pro-Russian fighter, and I will never forget his face. He told me, if you won't tell me the truth, I promise you, I will bring your baby's head here within a few days. He said he knew that my child lives in Crimea. He even told me the address. You know, death is not a terrible thing when it's your own. But if you think your loved ones could die, this is the worst thing imaginable. It's hard to overcome the fear. This is probably the only thing I don't wish even on my enemies. They had power and it's a good litmus test. Give a person even a little power and watch what's going to happen. A gun in hand is already power. And we couldn't question anything. You know, I worked for 11 years as the chief of the department in the commercial court of the Autonomous Republic of Crimea. 
And what did this mean? Well, I was a girl in a big expensive Jeep with a three-story house and a lovely family. I didn't care if there was a hailstorm, whether the sun shined or it rained, whether flowers blossomed or not. Everything was directed exclusively to achieve a certain career growth, to earn cash and so on. After I was taken into captivity, I began to appreciate freedom a lot. I hear the birds singing. I'm glad that the sun shines. I like the snow. I don't get bored in winter, which lasts for a long time now. You begin to appreciate life. You don't just exist. You live. It's an established fact that in 2016, in the basement of the Luhansk Regional Administration Building, political opponents of the so-called LPR were murdered. During the conflict, pro-Russian proxy fighters created a network of illegal detention centers on the occupied territories. According to the Eastern Ukrainian Center for Civic Initiatives, there were over 160 such centers as of June 2018, according to the Security Service of Ukraine, 3,244 people have been released from captivity in the so-called Luhansk and Donetsk People's Republics. However, the number of people illegally detained is significantly higher. The people responsible for kidnapping, holding hostage, torturing and murdering citizens of Ukraine in these illegal detention facilities remain free and have not been held responsible for their actions. 